So we do, okay. as it were, a important and unique set of developments to the tradition. But it's really what was happening more generally before Aquinas in terms of the education of Dominican students. So you go back to that period, early order 13th century, students would be generally educated in their own priories. So there were regional centres of study, kind of higher level, but your ordinary Dominican would join the local priory, and that's where they would receive their theology. So, you know, from Yorkshire, you come here to Leeds, let's say, your local priory, and Professor Ombres would give you the, the course on the virtues. And to facilitate this, there are various standard texts that developed. And one of the most influential is the work of the Dominican William Peraldus, who completed his own Summa on Vices and Virtues around about 1250. In 1263, Humbert of Romans decreed that a copy of Peraldus' Summa should be present in each convent of the order. Each house should have its copy of Peraldus. Now, whether that happened or not, we don't know. But obviously you can see the importance here of these texts on virtues. And Aquinas actually takes a lot of this just wholesale into, I mean, obviously he puts it in his own words and said, but I mean, lots of it's just wholesale brought into his presentation of virtues in the Summa. So Aquinas isn't just kind of writing in a kind of empty room with the sort of divine light shining on him directly in that way. He's using, I mean, not that he wasn't divinely illuminated, but he's using lots of sources. <clears throat> so, what is unique about Aquinas? Um, why am I talking about Aquinas in terms of our contemporary understanding of virtue or the influence that virtue has had in the English province? Well, I'm going to highlight two aspects of what Aquinas does, which in many ways kind of broadens our understanding of virtue. First is that Aquinas has this for these questions of virtue, you know, as a professor, lecturer in theology, you're going to make this kind of a mainstay of your teaching. But what Aquinas does is he adds prior questions. So you get the prima parts of the Summa. So the bit on the virtues, this big section, prima secundae, secundae, secundae those, all those questions, over 200 questions, come in the second part. So in the first part, what does Aquinas do? Well, he puts in place the theological and anthropological principles that will enable us to deepen our understanding of virtue. So that virtue is seen in this wider theological, physical and metaphysical context. He also begins work on the third part. As you know, he never completed the third part of the Summa. But in, in the third part, he is interested in the sacraments in Christology. And this is how, within the church, within the Christian community, we live out the virtues through the sacramental life in which we live out the virtues which Christ exemplifies. And Sister told us, Sister Magdalene told us earlier about this notion of exemplar virtue in God himself, but of course God made flesh is the model for us in Jesus Christ in those exemplar virtues. So one of the, the criticisms you have of Aquinas is that really this is just, you know, pagan philosophy with a little bit of Christian theology put on the side. But in fact there's a whole, as you were, structuring which transforms how he presents the virtues so that the virtues are presented within this fully Christological and Trinitarian perspective. Now, when he's, he's looking at a particular virtue the sister looked at this morning, for example, virtue of temperance, this may not come across immediately because he's drawing on various authors, such as Aristotle, so Stoics, and various other sources, parts of the church. But in terms of the overall presentation, it's always there. 
It's always permeating everything he does. So, as, as Sister, in the sense of just repeating what, what, what you said this morning, but if you take a particular virtue, a particular cardinal virtue, you can see how this cardinal virtue makes concrete and real the theological virtue. So, for example, you might have somebody who's a Christian employer and says, you know, I'm a Christian employer, I take Christianity seriously, I treat my employees with charity, but he doesn't pay them a just wage. So you say, well, you don't really treat them with charity because the demand of charity is to treat them fairly according to a measure of justice, those various measures we looked at. So you've got to think about how the theological virtue, primarily the virtue of charity, love, is made concrete and real through the concrete acts which are determined according to the cardinal virtues. So these two aspects, this theological <coughs> setting for the virtues and this emphasis on the concrete realisation of the virtues and real as a human act I think it's something which permeates the English province, certainly going back at the last 100 or 150 years, in terms of how English Dominicans have both theologically reflected on the life of virtue, but also how in our own community lives and in our ministries, we have lived out or tried to live out the virtues. So the first point, this theological setting, you might say, well, what does the doctrine of the Trinity have to do with the price of bread? But the whole point being that once you see what Aquinas is doing, as we saw in that example, charity is the life of the Trinity, love is the life of the Trinity, you cannot share and participate in the love of God if you are acting in an unjust manner. And this is something which is essential for a general understanding of virtue, but has been very ingrained into the DNA of the English province. So, you know, John is at the back. John, John probably has even more stories to tell <laughs> about the English province than, than uh, the news of the world could print, let's say. <laughs> uh, but, but, I mean, entering the province in the 1970s, one of the distinguishing features of the English province was the continuing emphasis and importance of core theological questions. So you have to remember, that, obviously I was very young in the 70s, but for those who lived through more of the 70s, dogmatic theology was not being taken for granted. You know, you look at lots of provinces, you know, something like the Chicago province, US, where the vast majority of people going off to do doctorates we're in applied social sciences, or those kind of areas. And those are really important. You know, I suppose as a moral theologian, I'm, you're always kind of working within those kind of fields. But if you don't have that emphasis on the core dogmatic questions, eventually, or pretty soon, you really go astray theologically. And of course, the people we have to thank for that, you know, Herbert's been mentioned already. We have Cornelius and Fergus, I mean, amongst others. So I think the three of them really were kind of, in a sense, giants, really, of their time. And you can see that more and more within the context. You know, not saying that we, they, you know, their theology is at fault, whatever, we can't question it, but in the context in which core dogmatic theology was really being abandoned by lots of people, they kept that at the centre. And also, obviously, particularly in the works of Herbert, that relationship between the dogmatic question and the moral question. <coughs> and the, the conduit for that really is an understanding of virtue and law in the works of Herbert. <coughs> so the second aspect, this concrete living out of the virtues. So I can contrast and you know, other religious orders are fantastic, have their own charisma, their own theologies, but in the medieval debates, generally the Franciscans 
Franciscans did not want to emphasize, or in fact, we would say, really talk about cardinal virtues as more well, kind of simply bringing into an Augustinian order tradition that we should really just focus on theological virtues. So why do you need all these cardinal virtues when we know what the demands of love are? You know, as Bob would say, all you need is love. But it's precisely as we seem to spell out what love requires, that we need those cardinal virtues. Now, this is, I mean, the Franciscan theology is legitimate within the tradition of the church, etc. We, 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 we can debate the pros and cons as theologians, and so on. I mean, obviously, we Dominicans are in the right place here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, we, it, it's, it's a legitimate debate. You know, and if a Franciscan came and said, no, really, you don't need to be talking about cardinal virtue, all you need to do is focus on theological virtue, we could have a good theological debate within, you know, within, the, within the church, you know, done in charity and respect, as it were. But I mean, our Dominican emphasis on cardinal virtue does give our ministries and our community life a sense of reality, as it were. That let's not get too carried away talking about you know, love in a very kind of um, general way, and not want to criticise other people, or a very kind of romanticised way, etc. I mean, obviously, we can do that within certain contexts. But the way in which we as the English Protestants have understood love is very much in terms of these concrete demands of the life on a daily basis. And um, obviously sometimes in how we don't live it out, <laughs> I suppose how we live it out, but the assumption is kind of running through what we do. There's no romanticism of religious life in the English province. Perhaps there should be a little bit more romanticism. <laughs> but there's, there, there is a kind of, kind of gritty reality to, to the way in which we approach things, um, which you know, sometimes people who come into us from other contexts you know, find refreshing, as it were. So really, you see these two aspects of virtue, um, you know, sort of focus. I've only got a short time, so I'll kind of wind it up soon. But I think that emphasis on the cardinal virtues, on the concrete demands of virtue, say it's seen in our life and our ministries, but also in some of our theology. So if you go back to Vincent McNabb, for example, there's a real concern for social questions. Because Vincent, like myself, studied Leuven, the kind of earlier Leuven method, which did use the social sciences and social science analysis um, to look at concrete questions of poverty, etc., of society at the time. And I think, mean, again, that's something which, again, is bequeathed to the next generation, and we kind of hand on, as it were, as a. I suppose Thomas Gilby is a slightly different type of. Uh, Right, I don't know if you, you, you've read much Thomas Gilby, but that's, that's a more kind of asceticised, kind of romanticised vision of Thomism. Um, so that does exist. But again, people like Victor White, you know, those series of editorials in the 1930s, uh, you know, centering on on the. Uh, I think he would never use his own name. It was always it was a Penguin or something. But you know, centering on, on on the Spanish Civil War, and so a real concern with you know, without as it were, you know. The, the province necessarily getting directly politicised in, in a kind of political party way, there is a real concern for real social issues of the time. And finally, just, just how this kind of permeates our community life. I think it permeates it in terms of our structures. You know, the question again is about structure and so on, how to structure promote or not promote virtue. Uh, the structures themselves cannot promote virtue. I mean, structures can, can facilitate virtue. There can be bad structures which can make the development of virtue in religious life difficult because you know, there's an unbalanced uh, form of government. I think the kind of the balances that we have, the way in which we have the role of superiors with councils in chapters, I think it encourages a development of participation an active development of virtue. And again, sometimes insofar as we don't observe that, um, but the structures are there to facilitate that. So again, I think it helps to 
to have a kind of robust understanding of religious life. It doesn't over-romanticise, but at the same time focuses on the practicality of charity on a daily basis. And of course, you know, we can look at individuals. I mean, I could have, you know, instead of looking at these kind of theological themes, I could have picked out any number of individuals, those people I've lived with, people from the past, who exemplified the life of virtue. And of course, we as Dominicans, we want to embody that to those people that we meet. In a sense, you know, we're not saying we're perfect, or we embody every aspect of virtue for somebody, but both individually and also in terms of how we live our lives together, I think we have to be seen as communities of virtue and individuals who really want to live out the virtues in the church and draw upon this rich tradition we have, you know, beginning of the medievals, and how that then has been played out in our own lifetime. And those people we owe such a huge debt to in terms of how we now both live the virtues and understand the virtues. <laughs> So there's a little time for questions or observations if people have them at this stage or we move on to the <laughs> next talk and save the time for the end. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll save the time for the end. So next in the lineup is Sister Filipina, who promises to be outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, thank you for asking me to talk and give me the freedom to choose whatever I wanted to talk about. <laughs> uh, that's always very good. Um, so I wanted to choose um, something that concerns us all. And uh, immediately I thought about friendship. Um, friendship as a virtue uh, and friendship helping us grow in virtues. Um, so first of all, are we called to friendship? Yes, we are all social, uh, so we are meant to have friendships. And um, there's a... Oh, sorry. And we also have in the Dominican order a great tradition of uh, very famous friendships within the order, within our communities, but also outside of the order. Um, so first, what is friendship and uh, what is the right way to approach it? So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about St. Thomas Aquinas. I thought that was appropriate this weekend. Um, Aquinas mentions friendship on the charity, which is uh, one of the theological virtues that uh, Catherine will talk about tomorrow, so I won't say very much about this. Yeah, but, <laughs> but as we as we discussed already today and yesterday, the cardinal virtues are guiding us towards uh, improving towards the theological virtue. Um, now, in terms of friendship, Saint Thomas Aquinas uh, gives us some uh, criteria to qualify friendship, and some were already mentioned a little bit. So he talks about friendship being an unselfish love and requiring benevolence. So benevolence, uh, wanting to do good for another. He also talks about friendship having to be mutual. Um, it's not really a friendship if the other person doesn't return that friendship. And it must be equal. So I think Father Bob yesterday mentioned briefly about that and then explaining to us that can we have friends that are not rational uh, beings? Well, if there's not really equal mutuality, uh, then according to St. Thomas Aquinas, it's not really a friendship or it cannot develop in a true friendship in the way he means it. Um, in terms of friendship, uh, he also described the progress uh, in friendship as a result of virtue, and that there is an exchange and a giving of self. 
but that can only be perfected in charity. Um, and for that, we also need God's grace. So we mentioned that a little bit as well. Um, we are limited. Um, we have to make the effort. So God starts the work in us. We then have to make an effort. And then we ultimately need God's grace. Uh, so the 5,000 followers we have on Facebook, uh, they're not really our friends. These are not true friends. I mean, some maybe. But <laughs> um, another point that St. Thomas Aquinas make is that when we truly love someone, there's a true friendship that extends to their friends and their surrounding, the people, you know, what, what goes around them. Um, and the same applies because then he connects this with charity. So then he talks about our friendship with God. And he talks about when we have that true, when we reach that true friendship with God, we can see that to some extent reflected in extending it to our love for the rest of, for the creation, for creation, for God's creation. So that extends to that. Um, he talks about friendship, that real good friendship when we've achieved it, being the ideal, re ideal relationship. He also talks about our friendship with God. And one of his criteria for true friendship being equality, the question is, can we have a true friendship with God? Um, that is linked with incarnation. Jesus coming down, humbling himself to be like us, has given us the opportunity to be able to develop that friendship and through him, having a true friendship with God. So that's for very briefly, I'm not an expert, what kind of St. Thomas Aquinas says on friendship. But then thinking of friendship, I had to mention St. Elred, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, he talks about three types of friendship. So now we're going into what really means we've reached a true friendship. He talks about three types of friendship, one being carnal friendship, worldly friendship, and spiritual friendship. The two first type of friendship, he says they're not really true friendship, or they're not really, that doesn't mean they can't change, um, but the ultimately what we want to reach is what he calls spiritual friendship. He defines, he explains carnal friendship being based on vices or bad habits, and that it's really grounded in our desires for pleasure and fun and all of this, and our emotions, okay? Um, so he explains that it's not true friendship. Worldly friendship, he explains it being um, us wanting to gain something, whether it's material gain, status, so it could be some type of friendship we develop at work um, because we want an advancement or some kind of things like this. Again, he says these are not true friendship. This is not what we should want to achieve. When he talks about spiritual friendship, which is what we want to, to attain really, he says first of all it begins, then it continues, and it is perfected in God. So true spiritual friendship have to be grounded in God from the beginning to the end. And its continuation is helped with practicing the virtues. So um, one definition uh, that he gives um, for friendship, for that kind of friendship, is that it's an agreement on all things sacred or, and profane or worldly interests, accompanied by goodwill, of benevolence and love. So in terms of the cardinal virtues, helping us attain that true spiritual friendship and ultimately, you know, us growing in perfection with our friends, um, we see how we practice this um, through the cardinal virtues all the time. So even if we start a friendship, that's not very well discerned at first, and it's kind of a kind of friendship, it's just about fun and, it, and, and those kind of things. Through exercising the virtues, we can change that. Things can change. So it's not like, oh, this is a bad friend, I'm never going to see you again. Um, things can change, things can get better. And actually, 
one of the points is friendship is not just for us individually to grow in virtue, it's to take our friends with us. So, some examples through temperance, um, exercising purity, moderation in our friendship, um, prudence, uh, judging the situation wisely when we meet somebody and being able to assess you know, our interactions, fortitude, you know, we use patience, perseverance as well. I mean, every relationship is difficult. We could go Introduction to resonance betting. <laughs> <laughs> because pleasurable action. <laughs> <laughs> All our course descriptions at Bristol, and uh, Fernanda will enjoy this, I hope. Um, 